believes in. And, and he, in, in writing his books about successful people, he wrote, uh, he, was, he was started with saying, before we get into what you're really going to do, let's lay some groundwork on how we're going to operate as people, as a group. And he had three, these three basic principles that he thought that you need to put in your life. Not, not in your life, not just the workplace, but in your life. And the first one is you cannot have courage until you first experience fear. Even successful people, even people that you really look up to, still get nervous and frustrated. I think I bet you would be surprised the number of people that you see on television or in movies or at the workplace. It's always in front of the group. They probably have stomach problems. They have everything because uh, it's scary. It's scary. Um, but that's okay. That is very human, and that's what we're supposed to be. It is okay to be nervous and frustrated and upset and, and worried. The kicker on this, and the sign of a winner, is someone who doesn't let that overcome him or her. I, I, I've never made a good presentation without first getting nervous. But I've never gone into a presentation and passed out. <laughs> so, to, to hand, hand the nerves, but to be able to control it is, is, is very important. I, you know, and, I, and it's what you call courage. You know, I, I think starting, starting football, quite honestly, took a lot of courage. It took a lot of courage from Dr. Romo. It took a lot of courage from Kerry Kennedy. Um, it took a lot of courage from us. It could have been an absolute flop. And how were we going to prove that financially we would not drain the resources of the academic side of the university? You know, it was scary. We, how did you know that 57,000 people were going to be there last year for that first game? What if it had been, you, because we, we set our performer around 15,000. Very conservative. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mr. McCombs has been, Rep McCombs has been a real good help to me through this process. And you know, when we decided to, when we got the green light from the system to start football, I went to him and I said, Mr. Combs, the economy is bad. Do we go forward? And he said, oh yeah. He said, first of all, this is an educational issue and you never stop those. And he said, the other thing, Lynn, there's still people out there that have money. And I was thinking the whole time, yes sir, yes sir, you do, you do. <laughs> Conversations with him. I mean, he's a major risk taker. I mean, I mean, he's. And so, one of my most recent conversations with him was about his Formula One track. Have you all driven through Austin and seen that huge track they're building? And there's a lot of naysayers that it won't work. You know, it's a tremendous amount of expenditure. And so he said, uh, we were talking. He said, you know, my granddaughter just came to me and said, Grandpa, how come you're doing this now, at this time of your life? I mean, millions and millions of dollars. He said, well. He said, I want to build something that's the very best. I want to do something that no one's ever done. And he said, besides that, I'm using your money. <laughs> you know, you got to have courage. I think the one guarantee that you have in life, the one thing that we can promise you today, the one thing that everybody in this room is going to make a mistake today, maybe more than one, maybe two or three, and you're going to do it every day. You are going to fail. I can promise you you're going to fail. And uh, there's a John Maxwell, if you have a chance, read his book. It's called Failing Forward. Uh, and he once had to go in and make a speech to a huge congregation of ministers about you know, how he built his churches and all that. And he said, I stood at this, he said, there were preacher after preacher that got up and talked about all the wonderful things they'd done. And he said, by the time I got up to my speech, he said, I knew that there was only one thing I could talk about. He said, my speech is about all the things I have failed. Yeah. So he just listed all the things he'd done wrong. He said it was the best speech you ever gave. You know, you're going to fail. You know, how many times in your lives already would have been real easy to quit? <clears throat> I remember that when I, excuse me, when I first took the job at Texas A&M, I'd come from Kansas State and I was this hot shot head coach. Taking the job again to say at 27 years old and then taking the team to the first NCAA championship. We were one game away from the final four, and uh, then I got the chance to go to Texas a and and it was an absolute mess over there. And for the first three or four years, I, we couldn't win. 
I remember one night, Bill was gone, and I was just walking around the house, and I was just, I was in tears. You know, what am I going to do? I want to get fired. It's over. And so I called a good friend, and she said, well, maybe you weren't meant to coach. I said, she said, maybe that's the message. You know, and I thought, no. No. I'm supposed to do this. You know, but think how easy when you get down bad stuff happens that, that you can quit. That's courage when you don't. That's courage. But the, the military influence we have in the city is unbelievable and we've been very fortunate. We do a lot of work with the wounded warriors and you know the, we've had them come out and speak to the football team. We had one guy came out, he was blind, half his head was blown off, he had one leg and his hands were so burned that you couldn't really tell he had fingers. And he went out and talked to our kids about do what your coach says. His his uh, the colonel that had directed him through that firefight that day was right by his side, and he said, "I did what this guy told me, and I would do it again." And I asked him, I said, "Were you were you were scared?" He said, "Oh, I was scared to death." But you can't have courage until you first experience fear. Second thing, foundation of human principles, not human practices. You can buy all kinds of books that tell you how to close the deal, how to dress, you know, how to make a speech. Uh, and those things are important. But what is most important is the things that Penn State's just going through. You don't have a good program, you don't have a good foundation unless you're honest, you're fair, you're patient, you're modest, you're caring. Build your team, build your life on, on very sound practices, oh, excuse me, very sound principles, not practices. The last thing, nothing can hurt you. And this, uh, I hope I can sign this well. Um, we have a tendency in the workplace to have transfer of blame, to blame other people. And what do you mean? What do you mean? For a while I had a staff that uh, when something went wrong, you know, they would point fingers at everybody else, and I would go visit with Gage, and she said, Lynn, your group, they're not taking responsibility. Um, you know, we, you don't want to do that. And I, I think that uh, the thing you have to remember is we can't control everything around us. We have very little control of, of most of our life. The only thing we can control is our response to it. Nothing can hurt us. And you say, oh yeah, and if I lost my spouse, if I lost my child, if I got cancer, if I lost a leg or no, I couldn't do it. Oh yeah. The kicker is not what happens to you, it's how you respond to it. And the wonderful thing about it is you get to choose the response. Nobody can make you miserable. You choose to be miserable. It's very, very hard. I, I you know, and, and I apologize. I do not want to be offensive to anyone, but I, my religious beliefs is that I, I believe in God. And um, I think the greatest thing that God did is he gave us freedom of choice. And think about this. If he had, I mean, he's in, in my philosophy, he's all powerful, he created everything. So why didn't he just fix us so that we don't have any weaknesses, that our bodies would last forever, and that we, we didn't sin? Why did he put that tree in the garden of Eden? Eden, uh, Eden? Why, did, why, did he, why was the serpent there? And in my mind, because he wanted us to choose whether we want to believe or not. He didn't want zombies. He wanted people that made a personal choice to believe. Because when we do that, we fight that much harder for it. We give that much back. So I, I think a huge thing as you go forward. Um, and when and Pam, you can do this for me. The next time I'm moaning and groaning and whining because I can't raise enough money for the facility. Just say, you know, Lynn, look at your response. Um, <laughs> all right, real quick, there are four things that I just want to point out to you that I think are 
are very, very helpful. And please understand when I'm uh, when I'm giving these things to the giving you these things, it doesn't mean that I'm doing all these things great. But I know that if I could accomplish putting my life together with these things, that I would be much, much better off. And I call them the four Ps. Not real attractive. I need to come up with another word. And you need to help me with that. We need to figure out another way to connotate this some way. <laughs> There's too many classes that are still remembering the four Ps. Okay. <laughs> uh, but these are four concepts that I think that, number one, as a leader you need in your life, but number two, if you can get your teams to exhibit these, that you're going to be very safe. You're going to win a lot of championships. Uh, the first one is, and you hear this all the time, you got to have a purpose. That means you got to have a goal or a plan. Goals. I hate goal writing. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. And in student affairs, we do all this assessment. I mean, we are obsessed with assessment. Um, but what I have learned is the more you write goals and the more you assess them, the more successful you're going to be. And you got a plan. The people that don't have plans are like that guy that went and shot 70 people in Colorado. He didn't have a plan. They're dangerous. They're dangerous. So you need to have a purpose. You need, you need to have short-term, medium-term, long-term plans. You need to focus on real small steps to get you there. The last thing we do to our teams in our first team meeting is we do not talk to them about, we're going to win the championship. Boom. If that's all they think about, that's too, it's too big. You've got to set little tiny goals. And, and every day in practice, that last year I coached, every day in practice we had an offensive goal, a defensive goal, and a tangible goal, like hustle or something like that. But, but we had three goals. We set our practice around accomplishing those three goals, and we graded ourselves. And then at the end of practice, we had marbles. We had white marbles and blue marbles, and we had a clear base. And if we reached our goals, we put the appropriate color marble in the jar. <clears throat> And then every game we had a list of goals that we wanted to accomplish. And at the end of the game, if we made those statistics, we put a jar. What happened was by the end of the year, blue marbles were good. We had a jar full of blue marbles. Without them knowing it, every day they built good habits and they accomplished small goals. So that year, we went to the Sweet 16 with a group of sophomores without them even really knowing what had happened. But if we had talked about to a group of sophomores, we're going to go to Sweet 16 this year, they would have all passed out. They've been throwing up every game. <laughs> uh, the goals have to be uh, have to be flexible. And they have to be your own. How many of you have children?